Um, once he's done, um, I will introduce the global panel to come on screen. So we want everyone on screen, cameras on, looking good. And um, we want um, to have the mics off. I will basically be reading off the different countries. And when you hear your country, Canada starting first, then Chile, Czech Republic, India, hopefully Japan, we'll see, Norway, um, Russian um, Federation, South Africa, Spain, um, UAE, and then USA. So when I read your name, I'm, I'm just under your mic, you have one minute, oh, one minute. I know, I know, I know. To answer the question that we sent you, is AI and machine learning. And we're looking at how that's going to impact higher education for 10 years. You've got to keep it on one minute. If not, my colleagues are going to be like, oh, Christopher. <laughs> so I'm counting on you. Um, I will stay on the screen. So um, I'll be there. So if you see me kind of move around a little bit with my hands, that means kind of, you know, you're all academia, so I know how it goes. I was there. <laughs> um, so that, that's kind of the plan. Um, after that, um, we'll move into panel two. Um, I may summarize briefly some of the high level comments if there's a theme. Not, we'll, we'll go ahead and panel two. For the, for the panelists, um, um, we do have a slide um, for each of the panels, introducing the panels. Um, what we'll end up doing is I'll, I'll disappear during the 30 minute panel. So we have two panels as well as a keynote. Um, if I come back on, um, if you see me, um, then you want the moderators to start wrapping it up a minute, minute and a half to start moving so we can keep the, the flow going. Um, so with that being said, um, um, any questions? We do have a break plan. It's a five minute break. We also have one poll built into the agenda. Um, Christopher, uh, this is Yuta. Uh, I have, I'm supposed to be speaking at another event as well in, during this time, but uh, again, um, very short. So how long should we stay on screen? Well, we have scheduled, I'd like to keep everyone on screen the whole 15 minutes that we've got blocked. So oh yeah, I'll be there the first 15 minutes. Yeah. Then you are you you are more than welcome to disappear okay. at that point. Um, you'll be able to to um, kind of uh, go join the other event. I, I get the double booking. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's that that's kind of the plan right now. Everyone stays on. They listen um, to to what everyone's saying and and so on. Um, just stay muted. Now, if you don't turn your um, your mics off. I'm going to ask Sam or Rachel to basically mute you just so we're not getting back background noise. That's great. And uh, I, I've actually used a stopwatch and timed myself <laughs> at a, um, a not too fast pace. And for the ASL interpreter and the captioner, I sent the exact script that you it so should go no that. more than one minute. So, so that's the you, you long know, chat right? message. Sorry about that. <laughs> I told you, Excel, they're on it. <laughs> um, so we'll, yeah, that's good. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, just try to keep it a, a, a minute. That'd be great. It allows everyone to talk. We only have 15 minutes. Um, so that gives us a little bit of breathing room, but not much breathing room. Yeah, OK, any other questions? Um, hi, Christopher. This is Darien. Hey, Darien. How are you doing? I'm okay. How are you doing? Thank you for the opportunity. We're very happy to be here in Zayed University. Extremely uh, excited. Um, just had, uh, so I, I just heard that, uh, would you like us to, like me to, to send my remark or our remarks to the interpreter? Would it, would it be easier if you read it or no? Okay. That's it. No, that was for you. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Not at this time. I imagine, you know, as if we did that, they would go crazy. <laughs> it's good to see you, by the way. Thank you. Very happy right. to be here. Anthony, gee, how are you doing? Great. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. Can I get you to put your country um, before your name? Let me just find where that is. Here we go. Godfrey, how are you doing? Good. Thank you. Good to see you all. 
you can see we have a great group here today. Did our representative from Japan show up? Let me see here. Okay, we might be skipping Japan. We still got a few more minutes. So again, just as a reminder at the very beginning, for 15 minutes after Excel gets done, we'll have the global panel come on. Everyone will um, have their cameras on and they will be muted mics off. When I mention your country, you, um, you come on and um, say you have one minute to say who introduce yourself, say where you're from, as well as to answer the question regarding AI and um, um, that we brought in for higher education and machine learning. Any questions? I know we have a couple people that have come in. Hey, Jonathan, how are you doing? It's good to hey, see. Hey, good morning. Hey. Hello. Masahito, good morning. Oh, good morning. <laughs> awesome, Masahito. Oh, welcome. Nice. You, you had you had me a little nervous. Not too bad. Oh, sorry. No, no, you still have plenty of time. Yeah. Um, can I, uh, Masito, can I put, can you put your country's um, okay. name before your name? Okay. And just as a, to let you know that we'll be on around 1108, I'll ask all the global voices to come on the screen and everyone just has a minute to introduce themselves and answer the question. We'll summarize afterwards. You should be on mute and unless um, your country's called. I know we have a lot of other people here from different panels. So if you're not designated as a, as a global voice, part of the segment of this um, event, you don't need to come on unless you just want to, then you can kind of, <laughs> we'll figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Chris, if we're, if we're in the afternoon panel, are we basically at this point just doing a sound check, muting and, and uh, chatting with our friends who are part of the panel? You are right on Jonathan. All right. Hello nice. everyone. Hello. Good afternoon and good evening and good morning to all my friends who are taking part today. Hi. It's good to see you, Jonathan. Good to see you too, Chris. Also, I'm extremely thrilled to say that the book on developing worlds and accessibility is done because otherwise there are about three people on this panel who I would be nudging for being behind. So I'm thrilled <laughs> to say it's completely done. So those of you who in the past have hid from me do no longer have to hide from me. It's where good you. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because we did have some people say that they were planning on hiding. Yeah. <laughs> I once went to an access board meeting in the US where someone literally saw me and they're like, oh, I got to run. And I'm like, oh, hey, no, 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 Jonathan, I'm not talking to you about the book. No, I'm running. So so there, there are those moments where people actually do hide. So thrilled to say it's done. So to my friends who finished chapters, thank you. To my friends who have no idea what I'm talking about, um, I'm just happy to be here with you today. You have the summer now too to do nothing, right? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Nothing. Uh, so assets, I'm the general chair this year for the assets conference. And I'm also assuming the directorship of the trace center this fall. So uh, there really is no summer. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes. At the very beginning, Rachel Paul from um, G3ICT, IWP will come on. She'll give some some basic ground rules, then we'll start letting people in. To give you an idea of, of who's coming to this, um, we have about close to 600 registrations, um, which is pretty good for a June event, I think. Actually, really happy with that. Um, we have um, 48 countries represented the last time we, we did the, the poll. And um, obviously, it's higher education. We've got folks from marketing, aerospace, um, defense, banking, finance high tech, medical, legal, software, and telecommunications. So we have a very interesting crowd today. <laughs> Francesca and team has done a great job pulling this together. So I just wanna say that up front. We, we really have had a lot of fun pulling this together. So before we, I be quiet until we start, are there any questions that anybody has? Keith, I hear you talking. So I, I have a question. question. So are we supposed to uh, switch on the camera only if we talk? So during the panels, the two panels that we have, I think it's best, we'll have a slide that the moderator will introduce you and then that slide will go off and you should be on screen at that point. So all panelists should be seen, including the moderator during, during those two panels that we have. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Christopher, this is Rachel. Uh, we've discovered one issue that apparently there's a limit to how many people we could spotlight at once, and it seems okay. to be nine is the magic number. Okay. 
So we have to might do a little bit of juggling around that as people are talking. Okay. And okay. I've, I've just one second, if I could have Jessica, our other ASL interpreter, if you could turn your camera just for a second so I can spotlight you. I can't, won't let me do it when your camera's off. Okay, hey, hey, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So Christopher, this is uh, Keith Hayes from, I was just uh, able to get back in and can everyone hear me? And you sound great and very professional mic, by the way, I'm, I'm a little envious of your mic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have one question, Christopher. Yes. Alejandro speaking. I will be moderating the, the, the last panel, but uh, should, will I be introducing the speakers? Because I don't have the bios with me. Um, you're going to be, there'll be a slide that will be um, up on the screen. Um, so I will introduce you and then turn it over to you. And all you need to do is, is just to say the name and, and the title of your panel. Um, we don't have time to get into bios. So okay. um, if, if the um, panelists okay. would like to, yeah. Got That's it. great. But I will have that information in front of me in the, in the, on the screen. You have it on the screen, so we'll leave it up. Um, Sam Evans is doing the, uh, the, she's driving the deck and she'll leave it up until um, you, you get done um, with introductions and then she'll take it down. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Speaking of that, Sam Evans, would you like to try ch sharing your screen? Just make sure that you are the slide master today. Yep. Hold Make on a sure. second. Let me put them in presentation mode so that I can. Do you want me to put the video up first, or just does it matter? Oh, uh, I don't know that it matters. But I mean, we're almost. Let's see. We're at six minutes till. So make sure we have time to run the video as we're letting people in. Maybe in the next minute here. Okay. So um, we're going to start the video. Everybody's here. We're start the video. Excellent. We, do we do we have the other two speakers show up? Kyle, are you there? Okay. Do, just as a reminder, we do have a break. Um, the break comes after panel one. Um, we'll have a poll and then we'll break for five minutes and then we'll bring in Lauren Allen with Google. There'll be an interview with her and then we'll go to panel two. Okay. So we've got five minutes. If you need water, coffee, this is the time to do it. We're back in just a second. Rachel, I'm trying to get the video to display on one of my monitors. Bear with me for just a second. Sure. We'll wait till you're set and then we'll open the floodgates because it'll take a few minutes to let everybody transition in. Let me move it over to a different monitor. Rachel, is it different in webinars than it is in meetings to share a video slide? I don't think so. 
the settings are set to be able to share. What kind of? Well, we didn't have any challenge last night sharing the videos, but I can't get it to pick it today. Sam, why don't we skip the video and we just show it during the break? Francesca speaking here. Um, since it's only two minutes away, so I think it's maybe best. Um, um, Rachel, I have Kyle who said they cannot reach the link, but I can resend uh, the, the link to him. I got it. Oh, you got Kyle? Okay, <laughs> thank you. I just sent another email saying I got it. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, no problem. <laughs> Hello, Kyle. <laughs> Kyle, this is Christopher. You're causing trouble. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> the usual, the usual. That's all right. <laughs> okay, so we've got just uh, two minutes left. And Kyle mentioned earlier that you, you um, if, you know, on the panels, um, if I come on, we need to kind of start wrapping things up um, visually if I'm on screen. Um, and I'll say my name also. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, so we're good to go, everyone. And Excel, um, I will start off. Rachel has a few words she'll say. I'll start off and introduce Excel move into a keynote speaker, and then we'll have the global voices, and then we'll jump into panel one, um, and then we move on. Thank you for joining us, y'all. Good luck. We are good to go, Sam. Everything looks good. Now letting people in now. Rachel will start in just a second. Hello, Pat. Hey there. <laughs> All right, I think we're ready to go. Rachel, do you want to get started? Sure. Yes. Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Rachel Paul with IAAP. Thank you for joining us today for the M Enabling Virtual Leadership Briefing. Before we get started, just a few items to go over. We do have closed captioning provided. You can select the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your screen. And we are offering today live stream captions available in Spanish, German, Swedish, and French. And those links will be posted in the chat. 
And today's uh, session will be recorded and available afterwards. And we also have ASL interpreters today. And please leave any questions in the Q&A and if time permits, we will get to those during one of the sessions today. And the chat will be monitored for any general dialogue or technical issues. So I'm happy to turn today's program over to IAAP's Managing Director, Christopher Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. We have such an amazing group of individuals that are with us today, presenters as well as participants. We have, um, my name is Christopher Lee and we have um, 48 countries represented today the last time we checked. Um, they, um, uh, the participants are from all over the place in the sense of um, what their roles are. We've got higher education, obviously, as, as we focused on the higher education universities at the forefront of digital inclusion is the title of this. Um, we've got marketing, we've got aerospace folks joining us. We've got defense, banking, financial services, consulting, telecommunications, software, as well as legal and medical. We've got it all today here. So anyway, I'm the event coordinator and I will be leading you through um, today's two hour event. Um, we'll get into the agenda in just a second, but we do have a break planned. Um, and we also have a poll that is embedded into the presentation today. We've got two panels. We've got a keynote speech, We've got a little bit of data to share with you regarding the survey that we did. Um, so it's really exciting. Um, we've got some good stuff planned. So stay with us and enjoy it. Um, I want to now um, introduce Excel LeBlanc. He is the president and executive director of G3ICT. Excel, welcome to the floor. Thank you, Christopher. And uh, on behalf of g ICT, the global initiative for Inclusive ICTs, I welcome you all. It's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, to sum up what we see today is really uh, exceptional, extraordinary trends for an extraordinary time. Uh, prior to the meeting today, we sent you a little survey to find out what were your thoughts about what's going on in digital accessibility uh, in universities and uh, what is to be expected for the next 10 years. So I would like briefly to uh, show you those results because they are a good introduction to the uh, different discussion that will be held today during the, the webinar. So the first question we asked you was, do you see the shift towards virtual campuses being more digitally inclusive and favorable for students, faculty and staff with disabilities? And here, about 55% of you said, yes, it's favorable. So it means that a slight majority of you see that it's definitely something that's kind of potentially positive. Uh, about 30% said, we're not sure yet, at least. <laughs> and 14% said, no, it's unfavorable. So with that question in mind, we went to the second question, uh, which is, uh, has there been an acceleration of digital accessibility of campus classroom environment during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that was super encouraging in a way because we see that 59% of you said, yes, there has been such an acceleration. 30% uh, said, uh, not sure. That may be because quite a bit of our respondents may not be in academia, so I guess. And then 10.7% said no. But there, the, it looks to us that the majority, the vast majority of folks uh, feel like 59% uh, feel like, yeah, there is there was an acceleration uh, of the uh, digital accessibility environments during pan the pandemic. So that's really a positive trend. So COVID in a way has been an enabler of accelerating the trends for better service. Uh, then the next question we asked you was even more telling. How do you see the awareness and demand for accessibility changing for campuses over the next 10 years? And here, uh, an overwhelming 93% said increasing. So that is like an extraordinary uh, you know, piece of information that uh, there is a clear collective consensus that uh, the next 10 years will be extraordinarily uh, important for students, faculty, and staff with disabilities in terms of accessing digital content services and products. So, um, um the, the, the following question, of course, is if, if that's the case, how do we best address this at the academic, in the academic environment? 
And so we ask you three independent questions where we ask you to rank the importance uh, the, of the opportunity of each of those three items. So the big winner was definitely, okay, the best way for academic uh, to advance digital accessibility on campus is to embed accessibility in the classroom. It's kind of a self, uh, uh, self heavy, not in a way, it's, but on the other hand, it's important to see how that is uh, uh, comparable to the number of persons or persons, as we said, including different syllabus or offering courses on digital accessibility came up as the top priority in 40% of the responses. The publication of digital accessibility came up as 20%. So today's agenda is going to really focus on the first two, embedding accessibility in the classroom, you know, what are the strategies for digital accessibility in the classroom and in, on campus? And the second one is, second panel will be how to include digital inclusion in the syllabus or offering courses. So to quickly oversee the agenda, the opening remarks uh, uh, will come up first, but it will be followed by the global voices from uh, academia, from uh, uh, 15 dif different countries on a very specific topic of how AI and machine learning will impact digital accessibility, which is really the big unknown and most exciting technology trend we can think of for accessibility. The second thing is inclusion strategies uh, in a fast technology environment, we'll cover the issue of implementing the digital accessibility in the classroom. Then we'll have an interview with Laura Allen, who is the head of strategy, accessibility, and disability inclusion at Google. Uh, and Laura has played a very significant role at Google to promote digital accessibility in all kinds of directions, but also uh, on a more uh, philanthropic way, uh, contributing enormously to the launch of the Teach Access Initiative to bring uh, you know, digital accessibility curriculum at the university level. And that will be the topic of the last panel, mainstreaming accessibility principle and knowledge and curriculum. So with that, we really hope that uh, this webinar will bring you a lot of the responses to those issues that you see as top priorities for the next few years and uh, even today. Uh, but let me first introduce to you uh, uh, the opening remark speaker, the keynote speaker for this session today. Uh, Deepti Samant Raja is uh, with the World Bank Global Disability Inclusion Team. Uh, she is there in oversees the implementation of very key program, one on disability inclusive education in Africa, which is a huge program that targets the education in Africa, but also she oversees the uh, inclusive education initiative. That means accelerating disability inclusive investment in education in general across the bank. And she also provides a lot of uh, guidance and technical expertise to World Bank teams that address the needs of persons with disabilities dif through different types of projects, so it's including education. So uh, a real uh, interesting perspective to hear about. And then prior to do this, uh, Deep Chi was Director of International Program and Senior Researcher at the Burton Blatt Institute at Syracuse University. Uh, she was also, for a few years, senior research analyst at GCICT, and we remember fondly of her collaboration with all of us and uh, uh, are very pleased to see her today. Uh, she also was before that research coordinator for the Global Partnership for Disability and Development. Uh, Dipti holds a Master of Science in Rehabilitation Counseling from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a Master of Science uh, in Electrical and Computer Engineering from the University of California, Irvine. Dipti, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Axel, and thank you to G3ICT for inviting the World Bank and me to speak at today's virtual leadership briefing on universities at the forefront of digital inclusion. There is no denying that the proliferation of digital technologies offers a significant opportunity to advance educational participation for students with disabilities across learning environments. In addition, the digital data revolution and its implications for data-driven services through machine learning, AI, and smart technologies are changing how persons with disabilities interact with their surroundings. Digital solutions are radically and rapidly changing how teaching can be differentiated and customized, how content can be adapted to meet a student's needs and preferences. Higher education is the bridge to work and income generation. And so it is essential that students across the spectrum of disabilities not only access and enroll in institutions of higher learning, but thrive 
and are ready to excel in the world beyond, which indeed puts universities at the forefront of digital inclusion to ensure that technology becomes an asset, a catalyst to inclusion and an equalizer and not a new source of inequities. You know, we cannot have this conversation without recognizing the role of technology in education this past year. As my colleagues at the World Bank's Education Global Practice point out, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a stress test for education systems globally. Now, there have been inspiring examples of how suites of technologies, low tech and high tech were put into play to minimize the disruptions that students faced in their access to education. At the same time, uh, there have also been many reality checks, particularly in the countries the World Bank works to support where the lack of you know, robust digital infrastructures or existing ed tech frameworks or the lack of stakeholder knowledge and digital content meant that many students with disabilities faced gaps in their learning. So we believe that as we continue to invest in currently needed solutions, we use these lessons to inform the environments of the future and ensure that they reach every student and can withstand the types of shocks we saw during the pandemic. I would like to share a few emerging lessons from our, world, from our work at the World Bank to support technology use for students with disabilities. First, students face challenges to quality learning at a systems level, but we find that solutions for students with disabilities remain narrowly focused. So interventions for students with disabilities still remain focused on providing assistive technology based on the type of disability, but they fail to pay equal attention to the broader ecosystem, including using the potential of technology to adapt the way students are taught or supporting curriculum adaptation. You know, we have to design systems to be at scale. And to do that, there needs to be a proactive engagement of all possible end users and stakeholders throughout the development and implementation cycle. So this of course includes students with disabilities, but also includes teachers, administrators, parents and caregivers, organizations of persons with disabilities to make sure that we really understand all the needs and contexts, including those related to intersecting needs um, of students with disabilities. So intersecting with gender, with linguistic diversity, with location. We must invest in the human components of the education um, you know, technology ecosystem. So the role and capacity of teachers and professors to make or break the success of ed tech cannot be emphasized enough. We must try to ensure that these systems can work in difficult settings, that they can work when students do not have access to high bandwidth, and that they are flexible and resilient to continue to innovate during emergencies such as the COVID-19 pandemic. So I am as excited as each of you to learn today from exemplary leaders from around the world who are innovating and revolutionizing higher education in terms of digital inclusion. I hope the lessons we here today and we take from today, help us to ensure that digital solutions at universities accelerate successful outcomes for students with disabilities and do not become a new source of inequities. Thank you and enjoy all the remarks. Diti, this is Christopher. Thank you so much for your remarks. Um, specifically your points about you know, integrating AT into the ecosystem and not just focusing it on just AT as an accommodation. Well, well said, and we we're so glad that we have the World Bank as, as part of this um, um, presentation day. So thank you very much. Okay, our next um, segment of the presentation is, is to focus on getting the pulse of what's going on, um, some thoughts around the globe um, to a question that we posed. Um, and the question is, how do you see AI machine learning impacting higher education and areas of digital inclusion over the next 10 years. So how are we gonna do this? We're gonna bring on our global panel of academias um, across the world. And I'd like for them to put the cam cameras on if they don't have it on. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna give um, each of the panelists um, a minute to answer this question, introduce themselves and answer them questions. I'm gonna read off a list of who we have here, which countries we have here. And the first country, and uh, we can take down the slide now, um, the first country is Canada. Judah, would you like to come on and tell us a little bit about you briefly and the question, answer to the question? 
Thank you. Um, I'm Jutta Tobranus, and I'm the director and professor of the Inclusive Design Research Center at OCAD University. And we have modeled AI after human intelligence, meaning current AI also automates and amplifies our biases and accelerates human disparities. Like human decision processes, AI automated decisions and optimization ignore human diversity and contextual complexity. AI therefore will compel us to rethink our understanding of evidence and the role of statistical probability. This will lead to a transformation of favored research methods, research ethics, notions of quality, and student grading and ranking. The replacement of formulaic jobs by automation will compel us to support students to differentiate themselves rather than conform to standards and to view education as lifelong. Students and educators currently at the margins will, re will lead this rethinking. Great, thank you, Canada. So we have Chile coming up. Christine? Hi, hi, everybody. I am Christine from Chile. I, I am the head of Universal Accessibility Diploma in the uh, Catholic University of Chile. And I think about the, this question that here in Latin America uh, is now is a, a huge gap between students with disability and other students because uh, the access to education is uh, expensive to people with disability. And that, for that, the artificial intelligence uh, is um, an advantage um, a good um, tool, a, a very indispensable tool, because uh, make cheaper the access to education. They don't don't um, can reach the education by a transport, even though is the in the same home uh, they can um, um, learn all the graduated and postgraduated um, topics. Thank you, Chile. Okay, so Czech Republic, Radek. Thank you, Christine. Hello, good morning. My name is Radek Pavlíček and I am a certified professional in web accessibility project coordinator and event manager at the Teresia Center of Masaryk University. What we currently face is the constantly growing interest regarding all kinds of accessibility services. On the one hand, it's of course very positive, but on the other, human and other sources are limited. To provide accessibility services to all who ask for them, artificial intelligence and machine learning could help us in all spheres where the output is sufficient for addressing accessibility requirements, starting with automatic captioning, image description, or built-in accessibility features of authoring tools. And human resources can be focused on tasks where they are more efficient than what AI and machine learning are capable of. Thank you, Radek. Okay, India, Dispendel. Hi, this is Dipendra Manocha, Director of Developing Countries Program with DAISY Consortium. And I'm also a partner and a mentor with the Assistic Lab at Indian Institute of Technology uh, in New Delhi, India. Um, for me, I think the biggest hope uh, is with the, the work of AI in languages sphere, especially when I come from a country with 22 official languages and also the sign language. And within the language frame, um, there are a few very important components. Uh, for example, the OCRs, um, uh, availability of OCR in all languages. And we have seen a big amount of detailed uh, work happening in past few years uh, with almost 250 languages OCR available with Google, for example. But the dream is that uh, in next 10 years, we should have this OCR facility in almost every language uh, of especially the low income group countries. Uh, and also the capability of the OCRs enhancing to uh, uh, also work in the area of semantics, adding semantic information in the uh, digital text. So uh, currently all that semantic uh, information most of the time is being put in manually. And I would really hope that the AI takes over 
and is able to analyze the text and put in the, the semantic uh, information um, and is able to identify what is the heading, what is the table and so on and so forth. And also able to, um, you know, it, uh, get into the area of image descriptions or identifying the STEM education um, components, et cetera, and making this digital text more meaningful for, for, uh, for the assistive technologies uh, for persons with disabilities. The another area where huge gap- Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm sorry to cut you off. We only have an, a minute for each. Um, and we want to talk, hear from Japan. So Masio, nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you. Hi. Hi, uh, good day, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Masahito Kawamori. I'm a project professor from Keio University. And also I'm the Rapporteur of Accessibility at the International Telecommunication Union. And one of our work items is on artificial intelligence for persons with disabilities. And I would like to emphasize that uh, for classrooms and also higher education, I think artificial intelligence and machine learning will have a, a big impact in the in the decade to come, especially in the automatic speech recognition, which can be used for captioning, providing uh, information to deaf and hard of hearing people, as well as uh, graphics and image processing, which will enable object recognition as well as object description for visually impaired people. That said, we can also explore the possibility is a hybrid approach to artificial intelligence with human health that would enhance the usability and also the practicality of the application in artificial intelligence in, in classrooms. So that's uh, what I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Norway, Anthony. Hi, everybody. This is Anthony. I'm an associate professor here at Oslo Metropolitan University in Norway. I also run seven startups in four different countries, which keeps me up at night a little bit. Um, in Norway, we believe that promoting a diverse workforce can actively contribute to more inclusively designed AI and machine learning solutions. So the main impact we're looking at here is how we can challenge ourselves to expand the diversity of that workforce. This means we have to really think critically about the power skills that our graduates acquire and how those skills can empower underrepresented groups in the labor market. It also means that we are con committed to continuing the transformation of our educational systems and challenging ourselves to give students across the spectrum of human diversity, not just a feeling of being included, but a feeling of belonging. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you so much for those comments. Russian Federation, Mikhail. It's my pleasure to greet you all. Hello, my name is Mikhail Mosgavoy. I am deputy director of the head training research and methodological center for vocational rehabilitation at Bauman Moscow State Technical University in Russia. And on the one hand, we see great potential for AI and machine learning to provide real adaptive learning, individual adjustment of the educational environment, and most importantly, to move from solving sensory barriers to solving cognitive barriers. On the other hand, I personally have concerns that the gap between the most advanced universities in this regard can only grow wider. That is why, especially now, such international cooperation and platforms like M Enabling are more important than ever. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Do we have um, South Africa that can come on the screen? Yes. Oh, there you are, see ya. Hello. Welcome. I'm Marcia. Lina Cleofus from the Stellenbosch University in South Africa, the head of the disability unit. And for, for me, the vision is really looking at universal access. So how can we make material environments, our information accessible to more people than not? So including people with disabilities. So whether you are blind, whether you are deaf, whether you're struggling with dyslexia, whether you don't have a hand that works, how can our devices become such that it is a completely accessible to everyone? Already we do have devices we, which convert speech to text and text to speech and so on, but people using you know, artificial um, limbs or cochlear implants, the world that we want to see is where everything can actually be 
so accessible that they, that we level the playing fields. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Thank you. Spain, Alejandro, welcome. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Alejandro Rodriguez Ascaso. I'm a lecturer and researcher at the Spanish National Distance Learning University, UNED. No matter how technology evolves, digital inclusion will always imply that technology adapts to our personal needs, preferences, and context. I think that AI will support personalized interaction of students and staff with university services, wherever we are. UNED has more than 200,000 students, including more than 8,000 students with disabilities. Big universities like mine will require effective and robust data models for users and resources, learning design patterns where functional diversity and personalization are considered, and of course, giving each user the possibility to scrutinize and manage their own interaction and privacy models. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for those, those comments. Okay, UAE, Doreen, welcome. Hi, um, greetings. Uh, this is Doreen Abulel. I'm the outreach manager from the Student Accessibility Services Department in Zaid University. Um, as a development practitioner, I testify that change is much stronger when it comes from wise political will. The United Arab Emirates is a forward thinking state declaring that all society members have equal rights to get digital services. Having that said, AI increasing demand will result in evidence-based and personalized learning experience for all students, including students with disabilities. The stigma around personalized learning experience will be eliminated, hopefully, because everyone will get to learn on a personalized basis where equitable access to education is a more proactive process rather than corrections of design mistakes. The conversation will completely shift focus from only securing the technology tools to design for better learning outcomes for each student. Demand on accessibility practitioner is on the rise and higher educational institutions should strategize to respond to this demand at a systematic level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and we wanna end um, with the USA, Keith. Good morning, my name is Keith Hayes. I am the uh, IT Accessibility Coordinator for camp, the Urbana-Champaign campus of the University of Illinois uh, in the United States. And uh, as uh, the, my colleague who just came before stated, uh, demand for accessibility subject matter experts is on the rise. Uh, frankly speaking, we do not have enough subject matter experts to meet demand. And current tools for doing accessibility evaluation are severely limited. Uh, they can only catch 20 to 50% of issues. The most impactful issues cannot even be detected. They can match patterns of invalid markup or uh, the absence of beneficial markup, but they can't tell if uh, the usage is appropriate for content. And so artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning uh, specifically there would allow us to create more powerful evaluation tools and expert systems that can both guide evaluation and create uh, digital materials. One of the things tools cannot do now is do the type of intuitive analysis that accessibility subject matter experts can do, where they can detect certain patterns and from that intuit and predict that there are going to be more severe patterns present. And using artificially intelligent tools that can not only match patterns, but can learn when those patterns uh, also will lead to more difficult uh, issues, uh, could even lead them to detect things that humans cannot detect. And so it would allow uh, us to create systems that don't require subject matter experts and can greatly reduce the workload of those subject matter experts where they are needed. Excellent. Thank you, Keith. Thank you to the whole panel. Um, it's impressive everyone stayed on the minute. Um, there were so many themes I actually thought that there would be one or two themes that would kind of thread across the responses, um, but they were, they were all over the place. And that was, that was amazing and wonderful. Everything from language, dealing with the OCR, um, dealing with diversity of the workplace environment, um, cognitive disabilities um, focused on that, personal needs. Um, so there's just so much here. And I really appreciate everyone taking the time um, this morning, this afternoon, this evening to, to give us a pulse of what's going on specifically around machine learning and AI. So I thank you very much and I appreciate um, your time. Okay, we're gonna move on to our, our first panel and um, thank you very much everyone, it was awesome. 
And so I want to introduce Klaus Messenburg. Um, he's professor at Institute of Integrated Studies at JKU. He's also um, CSUN AT Conference Program um, Chair um, and the Journal Track in Australia. Um, Austria. So welcome, Klaus. I'm going to have you introduce your panel. And um, we have uh, about 30 minutes. So take it away. Thank you very much. I trust you all can hear me. Thanks so much, uh, Christopher, for inviting me. Uh, Klaus Miesenberg, I said, I'm a professor for computer science at the Johannes Kepler University in Linz. And I had and still have the privilege to work in assistive technology and accessibility for more than 30 years now. And from the beginning, we did a very user-centered approach towards that. So we built up a service center for students with disabilities. And therefore, I have more than 30 years experience about the accelerating development in the technical fields impacting on the situation of students with disabilities. And therefore, with Heraclit, I can say the only constant in strategic development is constant change. And in particular, nowadays, AI, digitization, and the small biological virus, again, ask for strategic reactions not only in technical, also strategically, never to forget that the issue of inclusion is first of all, a human and social one. We do not want to build up technical high-tech ghettos. We have to focus that students can take part. They wanna be part of it. They wanna be part of the social process. They might be successful, they might be failed, but they wanna feel as included students whatever the technolo technological environment uh, is. And this needs according strategic reaction. And therefore, I'm more than pleased that we have a high level panel of experts working in this direction in setting up models for strategic development, strategic actions at university. We have Mikhail Moskovoy, who already spoke to us, we have Kale Shakmut uh, from Harvard University, and we have Andrew Sam from the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. And as time is short, and we have to be very careful with the time, we plan to have three rounds about strategic uh, uh, presenting and discussing strategic issues. And let's go right away into the first round. Uh, about strategic considerations these days to uh, face the challenges of digitization and inclusion. Uh, perhaps best to start with Mikhail, because, so to say, he is close to midnight or closest to midnight from the panel and therefore to keep him awake uh, and keep you awake, Mikhail, perhaps you can start and give uh, us some insights in your strategic ideas concepts for the inclusion of students with disabilities. Mikael, please. Thank you, Mr. Meisenberger. It's a pleasure to be here today. And once again, hello to dear colleagues. Uh, if you don't mind, I would say a few words about our university. We are one of the leading engineering universities in Russia. Uh, it is ba um, Bauman University. And we have exclu exclusively uh, full-time education form. And um, the main part of it is practical training. So um, it is very difficult for us to transform it into digital format, as to say. Uh, at the same time, we have a huge history of um, teaching to students with disabilities. Now we have more than 150 students. Uh, most of them are deaf and hard of hearing. And um, they study in a totally integrated form in mainstreams. So uh, at the same time, it may sound uh, strange, but our department, our students, uh, has always been uh, the driving force behind the university's innovations and also in digitalization. Uh, once we were among the first to have computer classes, interactive whiteboards, online courses, and so on, and then our best practices were adopted by teachers for all our students. It's a common uh, story, I think, for everybody. And so on the one hand, our strategy is to seek is uh, to seek to naturally integrate our students into the digital educational uh, environment of the university, uh, eliminate all 
any discrimination, remove sensory and cognitive barriers. And on the other hand, uh, we always are looking for new, more effective solutions and adapting them uh, to the needs of our students. And the last thing I would say uh, is about social process. As you mentioned, I also agree that it is really vital for us. And these two years, almost two years of missed time of this social communication interaction for our students who are deaf and hard of hearing, it was really hard and we see the results of this missed time. So, and it's a big challenge for us how to cope with it now. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mikhail. Uh, if, if I may, a short question to that. So in this process uh, of inclusion and also the social process, educators play a key role, be it in preparing material, being in terms of, so to say, starting and managing the process of social inclusion in classroom. Do you have any strategic consideration towards that direction, so to say, to train, prepare, or first make aware the educators that they understand and accept it as their role? Yes, of course, it's it's uh, very important. We have annual professional development programs, uh, so-called, and they are required for all teachers. Uh, and one of the modules of this program is about accessibility, uh, coping with students with disabilities, so these topics. And also we train all new faculty members who come to us to be teachers for our students. And we, we provide them with some guidelines and uh, how to work with students with disabilities. So yes, we do that. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Let me move on uh, to our second panelist, uh, Kale uh, Shakmut. Uh, from the uh, Harvard University, a model university in many senses. And therefore, of course, uh, we also expect model strategies, which we can take into account. And uh, Kale, if we could ask, where do you start? Where uh, is it more top down? Is it more bottom up uh, to address uh, the administration, management, financing, or whatever? What is, so to say, in short, the outline of the strategy you are working on, you are developing? Sure. Thank you, Klaus, and thank you to the IAAP for inviting me to to speak today. Uh, my name is Kyle Shackmet, and I lead the IT uh, digital accessibility team at Harvard University. Um, as as uh, Mikhail mentioned, the the importance of classroom teaching and technology uh, as a large research university at Harvard, um, we also take very seriously the responsibility to disseminate that research and uh, share it with the public and with other researchers and make it available to students. And if our uh, knowledge creation and sharing is going to be uh, shared, it needs to be accessible to everybody. So uh, we take both approaches that you mentioned, Klaus, both a, a kind of top down, if you will, and a bottom up. So from a top down, our um, institutional leaders have set a wonderful model tone. We have a policy that says any website for our university needs to meet accessibility standards. Uh, sometimes that can be a challenge. There are many, many, many uh, thousands of websites at a large research university. Um, but we want to make sure that everybody can access the information created and shared by faculty and staff and researchers and students at a, a large global research university. So uh, we definitely have a little bit of top down to set the tone and the priorities that accessibility is an important institutional value that we value inclusion. And one dimension of that inclusion is people with disabilities accessing our electronic content. But we also know that just saying something should be accessible doesn't make it happen. So we use the motto at our institution, we all have a role to play. And when we talk about our policy, we say, yes, there's a policy that says everything needs to be accessible, but we, the, the people who work at the university, all have a role to play in making it accessible, whether you're the person purchasing technology or maybe just researching to find somebody that can help build a website, can they do it accessibly? 
or to make sure that all of the graduate and teaching assistants that help put course materials uh, are trained on accessibility, but um, everybody who touches documents or websites or research data has their own kind of role to play in valuing inclusion with the data and the materials that they help distribute. Thank you so much, Kale. And a short question in terms you, you managed, so to say, this uh, comprehensive uh, strategical development. Do you see it uh, as granted and sorted out that uh, higher level management, that the awareness, the understanding, the support is there? Is there a, a need for strategically develop something like a reporting to the management? and also be it the situation, how it is and where improvement is needed, or so to say, is this no longer needed due to the legal enforcement and things like that? Um, it, it's always needed. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I've, I've never uh, worked at an institution where it wasn't needed, excuse me, um, both to help remind people as of priorities or issues of concern um, or to have the lens of access and inclusion. Uh, and then of course, at a large institution, there's always turnover. And so uh, the people that might be the senior leaders at an institution one year, in two or three years time, there are new leaders. And so uh, it, it is very important to make sure that there is um, updates and there are sharing of information so that uh, the culture of inclusion doesn't depend on one single person or one single person's perspective, that it can be part of an institutional norm and an institutional value. Thank you so much. And let's come to our third panelist, which brings us a bit more to the South on our planet. Andrew, Sam, uh, Andrew, your strategic ideas, your consideration. Perhaps you could introduce yourself as well a bit and then give us your first thoughts. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone joining in. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, so my name is Andrew Sam. I'm the Adaptive Technologist for the Disability Rights Unit at the University of the Bit Artists Right, also known as BIT for short, in Johannesburg, South Africa. And I am a network systems engineer who has been working with assistive technology for over 18 years um, and also at, at WITS, um, training and supporting students with various disabilities using assistive technology. So in terms of WITS's uh, strategic, uh, strategy in terms of digitization and inclusion, well, our um, commitment is really to provide an enabling platform to promote success by offering an environment that is rewarding, enriching, and inclusive, especially to all students and staff with disabilities. And that goes a long way to ensuring full participation in all aspects of university life. Now, as my colleagues before me just said, there are obviously lots of challenges. And I think we certainly on, on this side of the world experience the same challenges where um, certain, we, you need buy-in from, from the university, from the institution, from senior management, from the executives, um, to generate and develop disability policies that enable you know, staff and students to, to succeed and do what they're meant to do, study and work. Um, so uh, essentially, WITS took a decision many years ago to start moving into a digital space, um, moving sort of on uh, registrations online to look at enhancing classroom learning using digital services, whether that's implementing, developing, or creating uh, uh, smart classrooms uh, that can um, guide students on, you know, um, uh, or sort of pro provide students with uh, better sort of learning and teaching um, uh, services, as well as looking at things like reimagining our library um, to utilize the technology better to see uh, how students and staff also utilize technology in a better way. And we also know that with, as, as each year progresses, uh, AT develops in such a way that, you know, it is easier or does make life easier for a lot of students and staff with disabilities. And that's something that at WITS, we certainly um, have uh, embraced for a long, long time. We're one of the 
first universities in South Africa to support students with disabilities in 1986, um, something uh, which has grown and seen a steady growth in numbers over the years. And um, yeah, so it's something that, that we are very proud of and we're happy to, to see our students graduate and succeed once they get out of the university. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, short question also to you. you. I'm really fascinated and interested in this idea of a common platform, which brings together and developing such platform. Is this also meant to be, so to say, in, in terms of strategic development, do you also work with the peer students, so the non-disabled students? Do you see them in a role also in this inclusion process? Is there anything, out of my experience, we are always struggling in this term, so to say, to get in contact and working with the mainstream students at the university. And is there any consideration in this direction and issues on the platform you are uh, you are developing and you are working with? Uh, definitely. I think, you know, especially with, with the, the COVID-19 pandemic, it has forced a lot of institutions to, to look more digitally, to um, go more to a online learning sort of uh, pedagogy. Um, and, you know, something that VITS has certainly tried to do is obviously be more inclusive. Uh, so it's not, uh, and develop systems that not only um, support students with disabilities, but also support students uh, without disabilities. And um, coming from a developing nation, we have a lot of technical challenges, uh, as well as environmental challenges that may not be the same as in other parts of the world. Things like where our students um, may come from a rural area and don't have mobile data coverage or even internet coverage, um, electricity, they might not have devices, laptops, smartphones that cannot and therefore cannot access their you know, online courses. So there's a lot of things that we're, uh, a lot of challenges that we are having to deal with on top of trying to find the right platform that is inclusive to everybody. Thank you. So we can close our first one. And thank you so much for your insight and your strategic consideration. And I'm quite sure and uh, confident that this helps us uh, to reflect our own work, our own considerations and uh, brush them up for the future. For a second round, I would like to ask you uh, on the panel to consider challenges which are coming along. I mean, as mentioned by many in, uh, in this meeting and what we are aware of, there are so many challenges and fast ongoing changes, technological, uh, industry uh, issues, procurement issues, educators training, service provision, administration, financing, and so on. What is key? What do you see, so to say, as the issue? Perhaps with the one or the other example, you. Uh, in particular, refocusing on uh, these days that we can, so to say, get a bit of an insight. What is a core focus about this? Perhaps, again, to start with Mikhail. Thank you. Yes, uh, since engineering education programs are extremely difficult, uh, even for students without disabilities, for us, the biggest challenge is to ensure that um, it will be uh, accessible, not only sensory, but also. So we are trying to ensure that all emerging digital technologies, uh, all the content uh, is, um, is more um, accessible in a cognitive way. So um, as, a, as an example, um, I can say that we have one product is, uh, that is terminological base of gestures used in engineering. And it solves uh, several problems, uh, both uh, learning sign language, of course, and also um, like uh, contextual immersion in the subject area by students, by teachers, by interpreters. And the students can, for example, find the meaning of this or that term, um, also to learn a new sign if he or she uh, doesn't know it. And of course, uh, the development of such tools requires consolidation of um, not only university administration, teachers, but also specialists, students, and itself, it is a separate challenge that we managed to cope with. 
And one more thing that I would like to mention is, um, as you said, peer students. I think they have a great potential for, for, for our challenges and we see great willingness from them. And um, often uh, they benefit from accessible things. So if uh, teachers make something accessible for our students, all the students benefit. And um, we see that this helps to combine them and to make them more friendly with our students. And I think that's a great thing and we shouldn't forget about that. Thank you. Thank you. Short question, uh, one more. Uh, you are very much in software development on this uh, uh, development of educational materials. Is there also a focus uh, seen in terms of supporting educators, authoring system that they uh, supported in terms of developing accessible, understandable, also cognitively uh, better understandable materials? Or do you see this more as a service which is done by specialists? Uh, we are trying to uh, teach them uh, how to do accessible materials. So in, in our uh, educational program for teachers, we have that modules. So um, we don't have special staff who helps uh, teachers to do it, but we are trying to work with teachers. And of course, it is uh, quite easy with young, young people and it is quite a challenge with those who are in the 50s, 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. and so on. But oh, even, even them... My age yeah. range. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Mikhail. Uh, let me move again to Kyle. Uh, where do you see the most challenging issues and the focus which you see for the next month, for the next years, perhaps the one or the other example? Sure. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, I think it's critically important that we continue to promote and encourage the, the inclusion of students and especially scholars with disabilities to be key parts of our institutions. Um, you know, if if people are studying, for example, or creating accessible technology, but they aren't involving students and scholars with disabilities, um, it, it has much less, uh, less impact. You know, our institution should be able to uh, train and inspire and then hopefully hire uh, a next generation of disabled scholars uh, in a whole lot of different disciplines. If, if we only make disability studies or assistive technology very important fields, but if those are the only fields that we make accessible, uh, we have failed. We're limiting ourselves and the potential and the creativity of those audiences. So, you know, I know lots of disabled scholars in computer science or literature, anthropology, public health, law, business. And in the same way that we value the perspective of diverse faculty and teachers and scholars in all of these disciplines, whether it be uh, you know, indigenous communities or racial diversity, um, valuing and allowing these scholars to bring their perspective as persons with disabilities into their work will only enhance the research and the teaching and inspiring the next generation uh, of scholars. So I think uh, making sure that we include scholars with disabilities and promoting uh, their work is very important. And that that really affects a lot of the tools that we reach, right? If, if we work with vendor partners and they say, we can make everything accessible for students to consume, people with disabilities are not just passive consumers, they are creators, they are researchers, they are people building content and so we need to uh, allow and afford for that in the technologies that we uh, purchase and that we promote and that we build at our institutions. Wonderful. And so if I may ask this, then also the next step in terms of bringing the same idea out of the universities when students graduate, when they go out to industry that they find a job, is this also a part of your strategic uh, thinking, uh, labor market inclusion of your graduates? Absolutely. If, if um, 
we need to make sure that the tools and the techniques that we train students on are accessible so that they learn the skills and the techniques they need and that they can take them into large companies or start their own business uh, or work in the nonprofit sector and use those skills uh, to, to help inspire others and to do great work around the world. Thank you so much, Kale. And uh, Andrew, uh, if I can, if you, if I would ask you, what is what you, when you go back to work tomorrow, what is the thing you are working on and what do you would like to see sorted out in the next month or year? All right, thank you, Klaus. So essentially, I think I already um, talked about some of the you know, uh, countrywide challenges that we had, but in terms of an institutional challenge, I think, Certainly, once again, uh, moving to a fully online sort of um, teaching um, has certainly pushed forward the university's emphasis on, on digitization. And, and because of that, um, we've been, my department has been heavily involved in terms of um, ensuring accessibility and inclusivity to the different platforms, online platforms, and the online services that's been provided to our students during the pandemic. Um, and that's something that is always a challenge because we, we do need that support and buy-in, once again, from the institution to be included on these committees, um, the high-level committees that make these decisions about choosing what online platform to, to use or what services to ensure it is accessible to, for example, to for screen readers. It has captions built in for our deaf and hard of hearing uh, students and, and staff. Um, things like that. Um, it, it's, that is the real challenge. But once again, um, you could get the support from, from senior management, but then as, as my co uh, colleague from uh, Russia already said, you need to have the training to, to the staff to utilize those tools that's been put in place. It's no point in having the tools there and no one uses it. Um, so training and, and, and um, support from the institution to academics uh, and other staff members, as well as students, to utilize what has been put in place to ensure that um, the teaching and learning is effective. Thank you. And uh, one thing, if I could ask, uh, in your environment, is it sorted out that uh, faculty members, educational staff, that they, so to say, have moved digital? Or do you see also a problem that not only in terms of accessibility, but we have some cases, not at our faculty, but in other faculties, they are simply not really enthusiastic to move education towards digital. And of course, not digital means, of course, much more and all the challenges which we have in terms of accessibility. Do you see such a, uh, an issue in your environment? Or would you say this is with the pandemic and already, or already before this is sorted out? Um, there are definitely, I think, the, once again, in terms of, of change, people are reluctant for change. And I think our institution is, is predominantly a face-to-face -face, um, teaching institution. So moving digitally was a big challenge. And, you know, sitting on these committees, we have, you know, um, academics that do uh, voice their concerns, uh, their challenges in terms of moving online, something that they've not done before. Um, but obviously, it's, it's something where, once again, the, the institution then needs to show the benefits of moving online, um, whether that is, you know, allowing students um, the opportunity to utilize different tools, uh, different uh, devices, whether it's assistive devices or any other built-in tools into the platforms, um, to learn how to teach more effectively, a different way of teaching possibly, um, and that's something that our institution is, is heavily trying to, to move forward and look toward um, to, to better the teaching environment for our students. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, it's great to see that more and more questions, comments are coming up in the chat. And I have to excuse, uh, I'm most probably not able to uh, go through all of them and bring them 
into the discussion. Uh, I, I leave it uh, to the panel later on to look into the chat and perhaps we are able to answer them. I trust that the questions will be secured and that they will be integrated into a report. Uh, I would like to finish our panel discussion by simply giving all our panelists, our three panelists, the opportunity uh, to raise a wish, what they would like uh, to see done, be it in terms of uh, management organization financing uh, or other political issues, which they would like to see happening in the next days. And uh, may I ask to be short as we had it with the country view uh, in about one minute. And uh, perhaps we do it the other way around. And uh, Andrew, perhaps you want to be first. Sure. Thank you, Klaus. So just in closing, I uh, just would like to say from my, my point of view, Digital inclusion certainly plays a crucial role in defining the educational landscape of the future. Um, it not only provides an enabling platform for students and staff with disabilities, but it also promotes enhanced learning and engagement for all students and staff. And um, it's something that I hope with the improvement in technologies that we will be able to see that going forward in the future. So I would just like to say thank you and thank you to everyone for having me. Thanks so much, Andrew. And uh, Kale, your last statement, your wish. Um, I wish that our technology partners and vendors that we work with can continue to help enable uh, faculty and staff and students at universities to create more accessible content more easily. I wish it was easier to create accessible content and harder to create inaccessible content. Earlier, I said, uh, we like to say we all have a role to play when it comes to accessibility, which is true, but faculty members and researchers uh, are, are the world's experts in their fields, and they're often not the world's experts in accessibility, and they shouldn't have to be to create accessible, uh, easy to use content disseminating the research. So I hope that we can continue to find uh, partners and developers and solutions that can help our inspiring researchers create and share accessible content easily. Thanks so much, Kale. And Mikael? Uh, as for me, I wish more international cooperation to eliminate this gap between most advanced universities and countries in this fast evolving digital world. So I hope we all meet uh, more often and more productive. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So this uh, allows me to close uh, our panel and I'm very pleased to see that we are well on time. Thank you very much uh, for your contributions. Mikael, uh, Andrew, and Kale. I do think we got a very interesting uh, overview and very good examples of how to push forward and further develop the, an environment which allows uh, all the big diversity of students, the big diversity of stuff contributing to a richer, and more fruitful academic studying environment. And of course, the challenges are enormous as we, heard, as we heard, but I'm quite sure it's really a start. Digitization opens a lot of new opportunities. We often hear that digital technology is disruptive. Processes which were not inclusive are changing. And this gives us the opportunity that we influence them, that we build new processes, new approaches to allow better participation by a bigger diversity. And in this area, everybody who works in the field and everybody who is teaching, everybody who has a responsibility in this uh, environment should take it up and develop his own strategy to make the university a more inclusive field. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks to the panelists again, and let's 
rock on and make the university inclusive. Well, thank you. This is Christopher, the panelists. Thank you. There was so much here, a top-down approach, common platform inclusive. Um, we've also got peer students, um, different tools, especially for engineering that came up during that, for innovation, focused on cognitive disabilities, um, a lot of really good stuff um, to take in and digest during this. Some great comments that are coming in. Um, we're going to hear a little bit about some of the information just from our next speaker. We've got a poll coming up next, and then we've got a five-minute break. And then I'm going to be bringing in um, Laura Allen. Hello, Laura. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about innovation that will impact higher education. She's going to tell us a little bit what Google's doing, super psyched. She's also going to talk a little bit about teach access. So panelists, thank you, Klaus and team so much. Excellent, excellent panel. And we're going to now um, go ahead and get the poll up there. Okay. So we've got a poll and this poll is, um, we're going to give a minute or so. Does the universities that you most are most familiar with um, offer courses on digital accessibility? There's three options you have. It's yes, no, or I don't know. Again, does the university that you are most familiar with offer courses in digital accessibility? Yes, no, or I don't know. Give you one minute, we'll read the, we'll read the result, results, and then what we'll do is come back after a five minute break and I'll have my interview with Laura. It's still going, it's still going. Okay, so we are still seeing things that are moving uh, with, with the poll itself, but um, I'm going to go ahead and end it here. Um, we see yes, um, 39, and that's 26%. No, um, 40%, and I don't know, 34%. So again, yes, 26%, no, 40%, and I don't know, um, 34%. So We've got some, we need, to, we need to increase that, yes. And hopefully some of the information that um, Laura will talk to us after the break, um, specifically around Teach Access, will help us do that. So I'm gonna share the results. And then we're gonna take this five minute break, come back in five minutes for my interview. Thank you very much. The 2021 M Enabling Summit and Virtual Leadership Briefing is powered by Google. The Virtual Leadership Briefing today is supported by organizations such as the organizers of today's M Enabling Summit is G3ICT and EJ Krause. Thank you to the G3ICT IAAP EJ Krause virtual production team. Thank you to today's accessibility team, captionists and interpreters. Join us on Twitter at M Enabling Summit, hashtag M Enabling 21, hashtag M Enabling Briefing 21. Images on today's slide include people learning, laughing together. Images on this slide include speakers, presenters, and friends and colleagues. Today's virtual leadership briefing and M Enabling Summit is powered by Google. Images on this slide include networking, learning, speakers, and presenters. This slide includes exploration of assistive technology, presenters, networking, and friends laughing together. Images on this slide include presenters, speakers, colleagues, and award winners. Save the date for October 4th through the 6th in Washington, D.C. for the 2021 M Enabling Summit. Images on this slide include exploring assistive technology, presenters, and colleagues learning together. This slide features images of presenters, colleagues joining together in the exhibit floor. This slide features virtual reality exploration 
our chairman awards. Save the date for October 4th through the 6th, 2021 in Washington, DC. Join us for M Enabling 2021. This slide features people learning in panel sessions and presentations. Images here feature the FCC Chairman's Award presentations. Featured on this slide are images of friends and colleagues joined together at M Enabling. Join us on Twitter at M Enabling Summit, M Enabling 21, and M Enabling Briefing 21. Today's virtual leadership briefing is powered by Google. The next session will begin momentarily. Please enjoy your break. All right, Laura, I'm going to bring you on and we're going to get started. Sounds great. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Sam. I hope everyone enjoyed the break and, um, and we, we have a, a wonderful session for you, the second part of our session coming up right now. And that is, um, I want to bring in um, Laura Allen, who's the head of strategy accessibility and disability inclusion at Google, who is our sponsor today. Um, Laura, it is wonderful to have you here. Um, I had the opportunity to talk to Laura last week and um, uh, enjoy the chat and learning what you do um, and looking forward to, over the next 10 minutes to hear about what Google's doing. And I wanna just start off by asking you a little bit about yourself. I mean, how'd you get into the position that you are in right now? Thank you so much, Christopher. And I am so honored to be here. What an incredible group of people. Oh my goodness. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. So I have a very rare visual condition called choroidal osteomas, um, which developed when I was 10 years old in my left eye. And then basically when I was 14 years old, the same thing developed in my right eye. So for me, this, this visual condition impacts my central vision so anything I look directly at is heavily impacted, covered in sort of lots and lots of little flashers and pulsing lights, distortion. Um, and peripherally for me, things are still relatively intact, but it really, really was a drastic period of change when I was 14. And all of a sudden this was in both eyes. Uh, and I was in my eighth grade year and about to enter high school and went from being able to, you know, have typical 2020 vision to all of a sudden being legally blind and no longer being able to read a book, to see the chalkboard, to distinguish faces and all of that. So those early years were such a heavy, heavy period of transition for me. And working with my school and working with, honestly, with, with my family most closely to try to piece together all the things that had broken down in the processes. You know, my high school didn't really know the best way to support me. Uh, I was one of the first students to go through the high school that needed some sort of accessible formats and needed to use audio spoken feedback. And those early, early years, again, early high school for me was defined by dependence. And I'd go home after school and my parents would literally read aloud to me to bridge those gaps. And my dad would teach me all my math courses because my teachers weren't quite able to figure out, you know, how do you educate a student who can't see the chalkboard? And over those couple of years, we figured out the right mix of assistive technologies and the right processes for me to regain my independence in school. And this really included, you know, getting all the physical textbooks and stripping their bindings and running the pages through a high-speed scanner, using OCR software, and then being able to use text-to-speech to listen. Um, and that process by no means was perfect, but it was mostly reliable. Of course, there were lots of errors in that process, but it was mostly reliable and really started to teach me the true power of technology and um, helped me to regain my independence. So after that, I went to Georgetown University 
And I had a very, very close relationship with the student services team there. So I just wanted to take one moment to, to thank everybody sincerely who works in this realm of universities and colleges supporting students with disabilities, because I will tell you that that relationship with Dr. Jane Hollihan at Georgetown was so transformational for me to be able to know that I have a partner who has my back and I know that I'll be able to have my materials in an accessible format quickly. It, it really enabled me and freed me up to know that I could study whatever I wanted to study and that that wouldn't be uh, a barrier. So I just wanna sincerely say thank you. The work you do is absolutely so important. And at, at Georgetown, I studied marketing and international business and music as a minor. Um, and I, I loved all of that. And I wound up actually getting to Google right out of college um, and working in a totally different area than I do now early on. This was 11 years ago. Um, and I was working in the sales division and working on advertising and marketing sales strategies. And I started to sort of just reach out to different teams. Like, for example, I'd reach out, hey, Gmail team, <laughs> I'm low vision and I have some feedback for you. Uh, or would you be up for chatting? And I just was so impressed by the, the very warm reception I was getting from different teams. And they, they really just said, yeah, let's, let's sit, let's get coffee, let's talk through this. And basically at that point, I started uncovering the fields within Google of accessibility and was able to kind of over the years um, work on a number of different side projects, really increase my knowledge in this space outside of just my unique view of, of assistive tech and, and technology. But um, I realized that over, over that time, exactly how much of a true sort of calling this was for me in that I look back on those early years of dependence on my family and I, I'm the first to recognize exactly how lucky that was, that I had a family that could support me in that way and could bridge those gaps for me. And I know that's not the case for so many people with disabilities. So my main mission at Google is to help to use technology and to use Google's massive scale and platform to be able to help to level the playing field through the use of technology. Um, so I'm really excited about, um, you know, almost eight years ago, I, I transitioned into a full-time role leading the Chrome and Chrome OS accessibility teams, very rooted in the product space. So working on building out the different assistive tools into the browser and into Chromebooks, um, also working on making the broader browser and the broader interface on Chromebooks more accessible and more usable for people with all types of different disabilities. Um, and then I got to do a lot of work in the education space in that role uh, and, and you know, do a lot of work with the community because I, th I truly believe and so many of us believe that we need to be building with the community and integrating feedback from people with disabilities outside of just our companies, of course. So I spent a long time in that role uh, rooted in Chrome and Chrome OS. And then as of last year, I transitioned into a role on our centralized accessibility team at Google uh, where I focus on strategy across the company, uh, whether this is in our product space, in our internal processes, uh, but also in this realm of disability inclusion. So thinking about, you know, how do we make Google a really, really great place to work for people with disabilities? Um, so yeah, a little bit that's about awesome. about me. That, that is there's so much there to unpack. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just, you know, you know, flipping back just to some of the words that you said, I mean, growing up where, where you, your disability came and you had to deal with it and, and it changed and shift based on our conversation. So the accommodations that you need, the system technology all shifted and changed and your parents was there yeah. to support you and DSPs applaud them, right? Disability service providers are amazing. And, yes. and that transition from your parents to them. I really commend um, you sharing that by the way. And it's important, I think, for people with disabilities to be able to be proactively telling their story. So thank you for that, by the way. I, I, oh, ab absolutely. I, it hasn't always been easy. I will say that I've learned to, to be more open now. I, and it, it was such a shift for me. I have to admit, when I started working in the field of accessibility, I realized exactly how much value I could actually add by being open and talking about my experiences. Yeah. Whereas prior roles, you know, I, I didn't know, especially as just you know, a, a new graduate and being so young and not sure about my place in an organization and things like that, I definitely had to learn the path of disclosure and when do I feel comfortable disclosing and, and to whom. And wow. I just realized and I always encourage this to, to so many folks with disabilities now, students that I, I, I chat with and mentor of, 
you know, you are adding value. <laughs> know that your perspective is important and that the diversity is, is what really makes everything better in these corporations. So uh, I know it's a, it's a personal path. It's, it's not something that is, is as not. smooth and easy, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you sharing. And so, so yeah. tell us a little bit about what Google's doing. Um, you told us a little bit about your role, but some, you know, specifically around some of the innovative projects that Google has that could impact or are impacting higher education. Yeah, I mean, so I think there's a lot of a lot of directions we could go in. <laughs> and I know we only have a few minutes, but um, I think so. A lot of the work that Google does, it it can break it down into a few different chunks. So some of the work has to do with again, like making our core products more accessible and more usable for assistive technology users. Um, so thinking about things, I, I know a number of products are heavily used in higher education, like for example, Google Docs or Google Slides, even Chromebooks are being more and more heavily used. Um, different interfaces like that to just say, how do we make sure that this is a usable, accessible experience for anyone, regardless of how they're interacting with it? So a lot of our work has to do with that. But then there's also a lot of work that goes on across many teams of actually building out different assistive technology tools into our products. So for example, some of the recent things that have been announced or launched, um, which could certainly impact education, or like I think about things like um, Chrome Live Captions as one example, which is generating automatic captions. And I think about this because I, I remember getting sent videos frequently in university courses that weren't captions. And we know the best practice is always add captions, make them professional captions. <laughs> but we know that that's still not always the reality. So finding ways to be able to supplement that through the use of of automate, automatic captions through Chrome or through Google Meet. Um, I know, for example, in this, this past year and a half of the pandemic with so many courses going fully virtual, um, sometimes we need to rely on that. And I, we know that you know captions are, they can be so useful obviously for many different groups of, of people, whether deaf and hard of hearing students, but also of course, you know, students who are learning English as a second language or students who have, maybe they're not in the best connectivity um, from, from learning from home in some cases and being able to refer back to, to the captions is really important. So I think that that's a really important part of technology that's being built. I also know that there was a lot of conversation earlier on in the sort of global round table that went on, which was super cool about AI. And I know that there's a lot of different things going on. Um, for example, on the Chrome side, there was this, this feature that was developed called Get Image Descriptions. And I think this is such a cool application of using AI, of understanding what's in an image and knowing, again, the best practice is always going to be for developers to add alt text and add the description themselves to be able to provide somebody using a screen reader that, that full context of exactly what the image is for and what's in it. But knowing that we're not there yet, um, I and we, we need to be able to help, again, supplement that in a way by providing automatically generated captions. So I think that I'm, I'm really excited to see where we can continue adding more applications of AI into our products. Um, another interesting one to think about is there's an Android app called Lookout that Google builds, which is using machine learning to understand what is in the world around us, you know, using the cameras, um, the camera on the phone to perceive objects and, and people and try to provide that description, again, to give, give our blind and low vision users more context about the worlds around them. That's and then nice. the one, yeah. one last thing I'll mention is just, there's been a lot of additional focus on understanding um, more about cognitive inclusion and more about you know, design best practices, as well as different tools for cognitive inclusion. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a, there's a team that's working on, um, on the Chromebook side, for example, that was building a really enhanced version of our tool called select to speak um, just adding more and more functionality of being able to play, pause, resume, um, really see different highlighting of words as they're spoken aloud and promote better focus and shading content behind what's being read aloud um, to really be able to focus in on the core content. And they're working on more and more features in that space, just trying to understand not only for someone like me who's low vision, who needs that feature heavily, 
but for people who have learning and processing challenges that could really just benefit from that, you know, audio and visual connection at the same time. So lots of different projects going on, um, <laughs> but just a little bit of a, of, of a hint there. Yeah. A little bit of a dive. I mean, yeah. how many products does Google have? I mean, it's like, <laughs> I, I mean, couldn't even tell minutes. you. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're there. So t tell us a little bit, we only have a couple minutes left, but I wanna, I wanna hear a little bit about Teach Access um, because yeah. you're real involved in it and you're very passionate about it. So you tell yes. us a little bit about it? Yes, so Teach Access has been around now for over five years, which is amazing. Wow. Um, and it is this wonderful collaboration. It's an organization that brings together uh, many different companies, mostly tech, but we now have many other companies outside of tech too than many colleges and universities right now in the US, but hoping to expand that internationally, um, as well as disability advocacy organizations. And the whole goal is to try to get accessibility infused into the curriculum of computer science and human-centered interaction and design curriculum and a bunch of other disciplines as well. Just trying to get it so that when students you know, are learning, Accessibility is part of that core narrative. It's not something that's just only taught in an accessibility specific course, only targeted at specialists, but it's something that's just expected for all students to learn. And then when the students graduate and go search for jobs, this can be something that they bring value to the companies about, like they're able to hit the ground running in any role that they go into. Again, not just accessibility specific roles, um, any general software engineering role, any design role, and they can be the voice of accessibility and they can hit the ground running by building accessibly and inclusively. So there's a lot of work going on in the realm of Teach Access. If, if you're interested, go to teachaccess.org. But there's lots of work. Um, for example, we just announced our, our uh, latest round of faculty grants. So giving different, different professors uh, grants to be able to really focus in on, on building more accessibility into their curriculum. We just finished up our virtual version of our Study Away Silicon Valley program with over 80 different students from many different universities coming together to learn from so many different companies about you know, their approaches to accessibility and so many different universities. And they really got to deep dive and do, do group projects in this virtual environment and then pitch them. And it was, it was such a fun uh, set of weeks of all these different courses. But again, it's just really trying with many different projects to integrate accessibility and just, again, make it part of the mainstream curriculum. And we're really excited because Teach Access is going to be accelerating the pace over the next few years. And we've got a lot of momentum. We're gonna be increasing some of the, the funding coming in and we're just really excited about where this can possibly go, building out more and more curriculum that's gonna be a little bit more like plug and play for universities mm, nice. um, just to make it easier. <laughs> so yeah, yeah we're, we're excited. That's great. Well, I mean, I'm so glad that, um, we have the opportunity to talk about Teach Access and the link is in the chat. Um, Great. <laughs> so in, any final words that you just want to share with us, whether it's, I mean, from the advocacy side, obviously you're very passionate uh, about at all the innovation side. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm just excited about where the next few years are going to take all of us. Mm -hmm. I'm excited that we're you know, not just at Google by any means, the industry is shifting the conversation from compliance more to usability. I think that's really, really important to be thinking about, um, about like delight and usability. And I think that this whole shift towards like, how do we become more innovative? How do we think outside the box and work with people with disabilities to figure out the right solutions? I think that's really the key. And I hope to see many different companies and universities able to do that more and more. So I just want to say thank you so much. Thanks for having me and thanks for putting this on. I think it's just an amazing day. <laughs> well, thank you to Google, by the way, because they're sponsoring this. And we are it's such a wonderful pleasure to have you here and share your show, um, story and tell us a little bit about what's going on with Google. So thank you so much. Boy, wonderful. and um, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, so we are moving on to our second panel. This is our final panel for this event. And um, we're gonna put the slide up right here. This is mainstreaming accessibility principles and knowledge in curriculum. We have 30 minutes, great panelists. Um, Alejandro um, is here. He's a lecturer, Department um, of Artificial Intelligence at the 
Um, well, we are, we've heard from them already, but the National University for Distance Education in Spain, welcome. And um, I look forward to hearing your panel. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Thank you very much uh, uh, to you and, and IAP for the invitation. I hope that my, my voice is coming to you clear. And um, I'm really honored to be part of, of this panel. And, um, and uh, just let me say a few words to introduce myself that I have been teaching and researching on IT accessibility and IT mediated support for independent living for 20 years now. That's a long story, but the latest project I'm involved in is a MOOC channel that is offering now seven open courses on universal accessibility with different approaches. It's only in Spanish, and I'm afraid, but we are very proud to uh, that so far 16,000 students have already registered for its courses. They mainly come from Spain and Latin America, but also from the States and other parts of the world. It's funded by Fundación Once and by the Spanish Ministry of Social Affairs. The name is uh, Canal Fundación Once en UNED, and I will share its URL later on through the Zoom chat. But anyhow, the, 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 the title of the panel that is about to start is Mainstreaming Accessibility Principles and Knowledge in Curricula. First, let's, let me say that the poll that was run right before the break did not have very encouraging results, did it? The question was, does the university you are familiar with offer courses on digital accessibility? We've had a total of 158 respondents, which is not bad. And 40% of them said, no. If we take in consideration that we are in an accessibility-friendly environment, we may infer that the real situation is even worse. Also, let me say that if I was not moderating this panel, I would have registered anyhow to, to this because the topic is very attractive and so are our panelists. As we have uh, Dena Ahmed Altani, who is assistant professor at the College of Science and Engineering uh, and at the Hamad bin Khalifa University, Qatar. Gottfried Zimmermann, he's a professor in mobile uh, user interaction at the Media University in Stuttgart, Germany, and Jonathan Lazar, professor, the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland, and he's also associate director of the Trade Center USA. There are several aspects about, I will suggest the panelists to comment on, like the creation of the curriculum on accessibility, how to build a curriculum on digital inclusion, the design and use of learning contents and activities. If we have time, also about what's the role of certification, which is, I think is a very hot topic and very important in all countries. And what's the sustainability of all this? To begin with, I would like to talk about uh, the creation of the curricula on accessibility. I don't think that the programs that you are teaching in uh, exist just to satisfy the demands of external accreditation bodies or even the demands of your own university. Why are you teaching digital inclusion? Please, Dena, would you like to start, please? Yeah. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the very kind invite. Uh, and uh, it is such a pleasure to be uh, on, on such an important panel uh, discussing an important aspect. So basically, uh, there are two reasons, uh, just to put, to summarize. Uh, uh, the first uh, reason is uh, a personal reason. I'm, I'm very interested in, in accessibility, assistive technology. It's been my field of, uh, of uh, research for the past 14 years. I've been introduced to this field uh, back in, during my undergraduate uh, studies and my postgraduate studies at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, where I got introduced to assistive technology and I got interested in and I just continued my, my whole career on in this area. And, uh, and there where I, I thought it's important to, to teach students and give them a taste of what I have personally enjoyed and, and felt that I can make a difference in, in the world around me. 
The second uh, aspect is that basically in Qatar, uh, as you may all know, we have uh, a pioneering assistive technology center, uh, which is called MEDA. Uh, and under MEDA, uh, basically umbrella, there is a, a very high interest in education and facilitating accessibility education. So uh, I worked hard to uh, get an, a partnership between my university and MEDA uh, for them to establish a partnership and for us to establish courses and material in, uh, in educating uh, people about uh, the importance of accessibility. How can we build an accessible content and how can we work toward accessibility uh, in the region around us, in the Arab world, basically, inclusion and accessibility in the Arab world is extremely important on all levels, uh, from community to university to the national levels. As well, it's, uh, we, we, we speak and read in Arabic, so can I make Arabic content accessible? That's another question that, uh, that uh, we, we introduce. And not only the language, it's the culture, uh, talking about the blind, for example, or, or autistic children, how can I build uh, a content that is culture sensitive as well? So that's, that's the main reason uh, why I'm very interested and keen to have accessibility in the core material of uh, college uh, degrees, uh, uh, whether it's a postgraduate or an undergraduate degree. Thank you, Dina. Um, you mentioned the, the partnership with MEDA, which is, uh, is giving you more strength for your, could you summarize the, the, the key aspects of that, the, the, the goodness of, of, of doing partnership with, with other institutions or networks? Uh, sure. So MEDA, uh, as I said, they have this keen, uh, very clear message is to support accessibility on for the PWDs uh, or the elderly. And uh, now they are working in developing the MEDA ICT uh, assistive technology and accessibility competency framework. And this framework is basically a, a platform of knowledge to support educators when they teach uh, uh, accessibility and assistive technology material. And I've been one of the advisor in developing this, this content-based uh, framework to uh, support whether it's an accreditation or a, a postgraduate or an undergraduate degree. So uh, MEDA is helping us very much in this area. And I think I'm lucky uh, to have them here in Qatar. Thank you very much. Gottfried, would you like to continue? Yes, um, thank you for all the organizers of, of uh, organizing this uh, great conference. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be in this panel. Um, there are lots of reasons why we teach uh, accessibility and um, all this um, involved um, technologies. Um, I'll give you two of them. So um, my background is computer science. I'm a computer scientist. And I really find it fascinating that we can have this combination of users, human needs, and technology on the other side. So I, I don't find that in any other area of computer science in the same way. So if you just talk about uh, user experience, then it's a lot about yeah, social engineering and um, um, studies. But with accessibility, we have all included and we can make use of these upcoming technologies as we just heard by Laura from Google and others and AI in, in the Global Voices. So it's really fascinating to take these technologies, test them, develop them further so they are usable by people with disabilities. Um, that's really an interest in research and in teaching. And I see that uh, students are actually taking on and. Uh, catching up on, on this and that many of them are intrigued and motivated by, by this, this great um, combination um, technology in the service of, of humans. Now I know there is always a danger to just go from the technology side to it but um, I feel like we can make use of this because young people like in my uh, study programs are like really to, to model technologies, to build concepts and so. And I've seen that students really get uh, onto um, this, um, yeah, get onto this area of interest using um, technologies. Second reason, um, just a 
pure uh, self-interest because we're getting older. I myself get older. And at some point, I will certainly need um, these assistive technologies and will need uh, electronic media being built in accessible ways. And I'm already seeing that uh, my eyes, my eyesight is, is not as it was when I was 20 or 25. So um, usually I wear glasses, but um, I need glasses for driving and for looking in, in the distance. Um, so yes, uh, it's a good thing to know that the younger generation will take care of me and I will be able to use electronic media when I get old. Thank you. Uh, Gottfried, a question about your own university. Are they asking professors to design uh, accessibility modules? What's the policy of your university on, on that? So or as all external accreditation body. Yeah, as all universities in Germany, there is absolute freedom of teaching. So um, there is no um, committee that can dictate what a professor is teaching uh, in their courses. And, uh, but of course, there is kind of agreement in, in the departments um, as to who is taking on what responsibility in teaching. So for me, it's my job to do usability and accessibility from the technical side in, in computer science. Um, there are other professors, colleagues who do that more from the, the social sciences or like or, or from the use experience side. But we're a small university, about 150 lecturers only. And so um, we really, in this case, we need to build it bottom up mostly. We need to um, help uh, the colleagues, the professors and the lecturers to um, to make it easy for them to, to really do uh, teaching in an accessible way, way um, and on a voluntary basis, basically. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Jonathan, would you like to, to continue, please? Absolutely. Uh, a pleasure to be uh, part of this panel and hi to all of my great colleagues taking part today. And, and uh, uh, it, it's sort of an interesting situation at the University of Maryland. Uh, we actually have a lot of demand from students and from the local community for teaching more about accessibility. So it's not coming from external accreditation or something like that. Uh, historically, the college that I'm in, the College of Information Studies, has had a long track record of doing work on diversity and inclusion. Um, we have within the state of Maryland, a lot of the uh, national US disability rights organizations are headquartered nearby. So National Association of the Deaf, National Federation of the Blind. Um, and within Washington DC, of course, we have everything from the American Association of Persons with Disabilities uh, headquarters to the headquarters for the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled. So we have a lot of demand, um, for, we have a lot of resources, but we also have a lot of demand from our students for teaching about accessibility. And we have a lot of demand also from uh, the federal government as well, uh, that they need a lot of people trained. I mean, I get calls from people in the federal government saying, you're not churning out enough students who know accessibility, right? How can you crank this up? How can we get more? Um, so there's a lot of demands for accessibility services for people qualified in the state of Maryland and in DC. Um, the demand comes from our students as well. So we are we already have a lot of uh, curriculum related to digital accessibility, and we're still trying to add a lot more. And I believe that's part of the next question is what we're adding, right? So I'll, I'll stop there. I feel envy for what you're saying. Uh, I, will, I would borrow you some of them, all that. Demand we'll hire you. We'll hire you to teach a, a class adjunct remotely. Trust me, we have a very high demand. <laughs> I'll sign all of you up to teach classes. <laughs> Thank you. I would talk to my university. Uh, so, okay, programs we have to design them, and um, it's not always easy. And um, I will ask you about any inspiring references you have used, and um, and also. What's the best approach for designing is uh, specialist programs or trying to mainstream uh, the, the accessibility into, into uh, generic models, I would say. And um, it has pros and, and cons. So 
I would start with with Gottfried because you mentioned you are you are, you are a computer computer scientist. I I'm teaching in in a, in a computer science faculty, and I would find very useful and very yes very effective to convince my colleagues if ACM curricula would bring in more accessibility. In what's your your thoughts on this? Yeah, I myself have uh, tried to get um, accessibility into the, the uh, German uh, curriculum of the, the German Computing Association and uh, was uh, partly successful only. <laughs> but yes, um, um, to me, it's really important that we teach accessibility in computer science and, and uh, of course, all the design classes, not as kind of add on. Um, so th there needs to be um, like a mainstream part to all design and HCI courses where we not only hear about needs, but we, we really um, engage students in designing uh, like a journey, user journey maps or, or even uh, web pages or uh, whatever is subject of the course to be accessible, really a hands-on um, uh, a problem solve solving uh, approach not just uh, hearing and then forgetting about it i think that that's really important so i myself have actually used the uh, WCAG web accessibility web content accessibility guidelines and let students uh, look for errors in web pages and use my university's homepage for that now they're getting better now so i need to look for some other target but but anyway that, that's a good side effect and uh, if people have hands-on, another uh, thing would be let them configure their computer or their um, mobile smartphone to be uh, usable by a person with a specific disability. And, and they discover, oh, there's lots of things built into my um, Android or iOS system. And that makes it tangible. Um, and uh, that's really important in, in teaching. And then we have the um, other uh, courses that we're in, in now actually in the progress of setting up. So courses where students can really work with us on projects in web accessibility, really get deep into the, the technical stuff like WayAria um, and uh, also for mobile apps. And uh, we, uh, I am the technical director of a competence center for digital accessibility. And we um, have uh, external clients, other universities or, or organizations, industry um, that give us orders to check their web pages uh, and, and things like that. And uh, we want to really educate these students in helping us and supporting us to really conduct uh, these orders and, and work on reports and of course we'll do quality checking on them but later once they are really specialists once they've gone through this class and passed it passed the exam uh, they will actually be able to work with us as project assistants on, on real projects for for other organizations and industries and i think that's what they really want it's a win-win situation for us and uh, for the students thank you very much i think that the day of uh, that the institutional web page of our universities or the ATM machines will work correctly, we will have nothing to do, nothing to teach to our students. Uh, Dina, what has been your experience when designing any particular reference you would like to, to share? So basically, uh, I teach interactive design uh, for the past four years for our postgraduate uh, student. And uh, for me, as, as accessibility and technology, it's always in my heart, so I had to have uh, actually a series of, of lectures in this uh, generic course, let's say, that discusses uh, universal access, uh, the WCAG uh, guidelines, and uh, giving ass assignment. And actually, something interesting I would hear from our students usually come from a data science uh, track uh, of uh, or engineering or electronic engineering track, they would always tell me that this class in particular is an eye opener uh, because they would realize that they have a broader uh, context of users. So we they don't always design for the mainstream, but in fact they need to consider and and uh, and as we said. Uh, we would always at some certain time or age, we will have a disability in some sort. 
uh, eyesight or, or other, uh, other disabilities. So we need to put these uh, aspects in mind. And uh, uh, usually uh, this course is very interesting for them. And I would take them to, uh, to Meda Center for them to see how the uh, website accreditation happens, uh, how do apps accreditation happens in Qatar and uh, how, do they, uh, how do we ensure a website is accessible. And then toward the end of, of the semester, they will have an assignment to check the accessibility of uh, maybe the university website. I, I would usually ask them to choose some, some website and because most of them are part-timers, so uh, they work in their own institute. So I would tell them, check the accessibility of the website of the institute you work in. Uh, and now I'm in the process of developing a web, an ICT accessibility course that will be offered for our undergraduate. And that course will be fully dedicated to uh, the accessibility and assistive technology. Thank you, Dina. Jonathan, um, Dina and, and uh, Gottfried has, have shared some of the practices or the good practices to engage and to motivate learners. Do you, do you have any to, to share with, with us that has proven to be effective? In the Absolutely. Environment? Absolutely. I can, I can actually give uh, two examples in addition to what they've already said. Um, uh, as, as they both mentioned that we try to integrate accessibility in the curriculum, not just provide it at the end. Uh, and there are two ways that we do this. Um, one, first of all, for instance, the graduate class, Fundamentals of Human Computer Interaction. We teach accessibility in the first class they take, not in the last class they take. Because obviously one of the big problems is people learn about accessibility right at the end and then Students sometimes think of it in that way. Oh, you build something and then you go back and add accessibility. Of course, we know that's the least effective way to do it. The most effective way is to integrate accessibility when you do design. So um, in that fundamentals class, we also do something similar in an undergraduate class. So it's not at the end, uh, but there's a requirement for all students to learn about accessibility. Uh, but in the fundamentals of HCI class at a graduate level, students not only learn about accessibility in their first class, but also uh, they do a comparison study, right? And the idea is often, again, if you know a little bit about accessibility, right, but not a lot, students often will type in a URL into an automated testing tool and say, oh, oh my gosh, look, there's a hundred accessibility flaws. Wow, this is really bad and stop there. And so what I do instead is I have the students do a manual inspection of a website, right? Using the web content accessibility guidelines and then I have them use the automated tool afterwards. So they don't just think an automated tool like Wave or something, aha, that's the final answer, but they actually get to learn that there are lots of different approaches, right, with different levels of accuracy as one of the um, speakers earlier today mentioned. Um, and so that's, that's another approach we do. Um, there's a class that we couldn't offer during the pandemic, but one class that I've offered at both the University of Maryland and previously at Towson University, and that's where I actually have students, and that's a separate class, where I have students go out and engage with organizations in the community and engage with people with disabilities. And so, again, we have a lot of great resources, and, you know, it's not the same learning experience to read about it on the web as it is to go visit the Library for the Blind and Print Disabled, or to go to the headquarters of the National Federation of the Blind or to go and visit, I mean, in, in DC, we've done this to, um, to Gallaudet University, you know, the university for uh, deaf students in DC, right? And so I try as much as possible to get students outside of that, oh, I just read about accessibility in a book and I'm done. I try to get them to either understand, like the example of learning different methods, even at the beginning, to understand how effective one is versus another. And then ideally, post pandemic again, I try to get students out in the community meeting people face to face and getting that understanding of the context of use. Thank you very much. We have some two minutes to finish, but I would like to address one very important topic that for me as a, a, a lecturer is important. Um, this is the increase in importance of certificates. Um, what's the role of, of us like teachers how do we align what we teach at university with this, with, that, with these certificates? Because in the end, we want our students to be very well prepared for, for when they get to, to job, to work. So Godfrey, would you like to comment? 
I think it's very important. Uh, it, it's another motivation for students. Uh, if we uh, tell them, okay, if you have um, passed this exam at university, we give you the, you the opportunity of acquiring a certificate that is industry widely acknowledged. Um, and has like the big companies on it, basically. Um, and um, we, we actually, uh, we have a project uh, that, that's uh, going to start in August with, with funding. And one of its uh, measures will be really to, to make that happen um, and to give recommendations to other universities to align their course programs to the IAAP um, uh, certifications. Um, and I'm glad IAAP has that program and we've, um, I've been personally involved in translating that to the German language, um, the bodies of knowledge and the exam questions. Not that my students would necessarily need that, but we also teach professional development courses. And there we, we see that when it comes to exam situations, people really in Germany prefer the German language. I think that cultural aspect is very important. Dina, would, that, would you like to add something? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so usually, uh, as you said, uh, most of, of our students are part-timers who are already have jobs. So what, what I usually do, uh, I would guide them through the uh, certificate uh, programs available to uh, uh, support them in their own jobs. And I, I would usually have like a slide or two telling them toward the end of the class that there are a professional track related to accessibility and if it can be of your interest. And, and I've seen actually some of my own postgraduate student, uh, my master's student and my PhD working toward uh, attaining these uh, certificates and just putting it uh, on spot in the classes, I think is extremely important. Thank you very much. Jonathan? Aside from the courses that I mentioned previously, which are the ones where all the students have to take them that have access and they have accessibility components, we're actually in the process of developing both an undergraduate major on accessibility and also a, a, a separate certificate program within our master's degree focused on accessibility. And actually we are looking at trying to integrate certification into the master's program. So if you're coming for a master's in human computer interaction uh, with a focus uh, certificate on accessibility that you would also be taking part then in a, a certification uh, process as part of that. So yes, we are, we are looking for all the reasons that they both already mentioned. Well, that's great. <laughs> So thank panel. you all very um, much, Christopher. Yeah. Thank you. So we had so much here, and there was so much to. Um, we needed more time. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful panel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I want to thank um, everyone. We're at the very end um, of our um, of our event today. There's so many people to thank. I want to thank um, obviously G3 ICT um, and the EJ Kraus. Um, team. They have been a big part in pulling this event together. I want to bring up the slides right now. Sam, if you could help me out. And um, we want to make sure that people stay connected. Um, we want to make sure that you know that you need to hold the date. We are having virtual and on-site. M Enabling Summit is going to be October 4th through the 6th um, in DC. We'll have both, as I mentioned, virtual as well as on-site. So we're pretty excited about that. Next slide. And I want to make sure that everyone knows that Google has been such a, you know, just an incredible source um, in, in pulling this together. So thank you, Google. And we have many other sponsors tied to this, as well as all our um, virtual briefings um, that uh, G3ICT and EJ Kraus has, has pulled together. So these are just a few of them in regards to Nobility and Pete and TDI and Bacardi Center and so on. So many of those. And then especially I want to thank the team. What, what an amazing team that we have to pull this together. Um, just a lot going on, as you know, behind the scenes. And these are the faces that you have seen on the slide um, that have been doing that. And then finally, um, I want to thank our accessibility team. Beth, thank you so much. Um, Jessica, thank you so much. And thank our captionists. And everyone, have a great rest of the evening, afternoon, uh, morning, and um, stay tuned and stay connected. Um, we'll be having more virtual briefings as well as the October 4th M Enabling Summit. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate it. Y'all great. Thank you again.